good morning. Good morning. And welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, whether you're here in person or joining us online. Thank you, Pam. I forgot to do that. Um, a few announcements. Um, uh, first of all, we uh, are... Wabash County remains at a zero on the uh, weekly metric score for COVID, and that's good. That means there's no longer any COVID restrictions in place. Um, however, just to be sure, we will be continuing to serve communion like we've been doing, where the ushers are wearing gloves and handing you the elements. We'll, we'll do that for one more time. Um, our second mile monthly giving emphasis for the month of April is our own uh, Sycamore Preschool, and our goal is $500. Uh, last month, uh, our uh, emphasis was the Manchester Fellowship of Churches. Our goal was $500, and you gave 644 so good job. Um, we also continue to collect for UNCOR's work with Ukrainian refugees. Um, uh, through last week, you have given $655 toward that, so very good. And I forgot the number. I meant to write it down. It was on the screen, but you gave a little over $1,600 for UMCOR Sunday, um, which goes to uh, pay UMCOR's overhead. So that's awesome so that they can uh, be involved in so much more and um, without having to take money out of the individual askings. Excuse me. Um, also uh, had a request to announce that the North Manchester Center for History is hosting Auto Indiana, a, uh, one of the Indiana Historical Society's traveling exhibits through the month of April. Um, it's a uh, exhibit takes you uh, kind of on a ride through the history of uh, Indiana's automotive past, which is never knew until I moved here just how much there was in Indiana with uh, the early, especially the early automotive history, uh, but the center. Four History is located on Main Street downtown, and uh, I'm sure they would love if you came to visit sometime. Also on your bulletin insert, a reminder that we have a Pops dinner this Friday, uh, 4 o'clock, hopefully our last drive through hopefully, um, but this one is still a drive through so we still need cookies. Um, hopefully, there, there's two or three people that ask every time, hopefully it'll be indoors and pies next time because people are missing their pies, apparently. But cookies for this time still. Uh, there's also information about um, Holy Week opportunities to worship Thursday. Uh, Monday, Thursday, we'll be having a, a service here at 7 p.m. And then on Good Friday at noon, we'll be having a, a, a community service at First Brethren Church. And then on uh, Easter this, uh, this year, um, Easter has been so messed up the last two years that I've been here, but... Um, at least we'll, you know, we'll all be here and we can, we can now have breakfast. So we'll have um, the uh, two services that morning, 8.15 and 10.30, but they'll be very different services if you want to go to each. The first one we'll be doing in the style of a sunrise service, even though the sun will have already risen by then, um, but not too much. And uh, uh, it focuses on uh, uh, God's promises and fulfilling of God's promises through the coming of the Christ, uh, and then our baptismal, um, uh, yeah, what's the word I'm looking for? What happens when I don't write it down? Our vow, well, we, yeah, renewing our baptismal vows, okay. Then in the second service will be a service of word and table, much like a, a regular service. We will also be having a baptism in the second service, so... Look forward to all of that. Any other announcements? Say, what? Who? Oh, I saw, I saw it was coming up. Um, good to see you, Pam. Been a while. Last time I've seen her, she's been on her back. In a, in a hospital bed, so, wow. All right, any other announcements? Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude.
She sets the bar higher every week. That's just me. Please stand if you are able and join me in the call to worship. Prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ brings to you. As he who is called, he who is holy. holy. Be holy yourself in all conduct. For it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Trust in God, who raised him and gave him glory. For to your faith and hope are set in God. Our opening hymn is Christ, whose glory fills the skies. The words will be on the screen and in your hymnal on page 173. Please join with me in the opening prayer. Holy One, light of light, God of all creation, long ago you showed yourself to disciples in the person of Jesus. Shine in us, around us, and through us, that the world may see your glory in the faces of your people. Faces transformed in the light of your love. Amen. You may be seated. In our first scripture lesson taken from the first chapter of 2 Peter, Peter rebuts false teachers with the eyewitness testimony of Jesus' transfiguration. We didn't repeat crafty myths when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Quite the contrary, we witnessed this, his majesty with our own eyes. He received honor and glory from God the Father when a voice came to him from the magnificent glory saying, this is my dearly loved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard his voice from the heaven while we were within on the holy, with him on the holy mountain. In addition, we have a most reliable prophetic word, and you would do well to pay attention to it, just as you would to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Most important, you must know that no prophecy of scripture represents the prophet's own understanding of things, because no prophecy ever came by human will. Instead, Men and women, led by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. You remain seated as we sing our hymn of preparation, O Love How Deep. The words will be on the screen.
please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our lesson taken from the 8th chapter of John, Jesus closed a heated debate with the Jewish leaders by claiming the divine name, I am. Jesus said, I'm not trying to bring glory to myself. There is one who is seeking to glorify me, and he is the judge. I assure you that whoever keeps my word will never die. The Jewish op opposition said to Jesus, now we know you, you have a demon. Abraham and the prophets died. Yet you say, whoever keeps my word will never die. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and the prophets died. So who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is meaningless. My father, who you say is your God, is the one who glorifies me. You don't know him, but I do. If I said I didn't know him, I would be like, be like you, a liar. But I do know him, and I keep my word. Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and was happy. You aren't even 50 years old, the Jewish opposition replied. How can you say that you have seen Abraham? I assure you, Jesus replied, before Abraham was, I am. So he picked up stone, so they picked up stone to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You ever tried figuring someone out? Yesterday, someone shared a, an article that had a very intriguing title on Facebook. But at least the little part they shared didn't identify who the author was, so I wasn't sure. I wanted to read it. The title was good enough, shows you how important titles are. I, I clicked through and I saw that, okay, I don't know this person. Didn't recognize the name. He went to the person's blog, his picture was there. Didn't know from the picture. And honestly, I'm probably overly picky. When it comes to certain areas, and. This happened to be a theological article. That's certainly one of those areas. In certain areas, there are some authors I really like to read. Some I know it's going to be a waste of my time to read because I just will not agree with them at all. In fact, they might even raise my blood pressure. Unfortunately, the biggest group is people I just don't know and hadn't heard of yet. So I did a little more digging. Anybody who publishes, writes on a blog or posts somehow on the internet is probably going to have some information about themselves. And sure enough, up there, I had the choice. I hit about. Come to find out, the gentleman who wrote it is a recently retired United Methodist pastor who, of all things, grew up as a Southern Baptist. That was intriguing. Wow. Hadn't heard of him before, but read what he had there in his little bio, and then did a quick Google search, found a couple, oh, there, there's a United Methodist News Service article about a book he wrote. Oh, that sounds pretty good. I haven't read it yet, but I, at least I saved the article. Maybe I'll get it read this afternoon. You ever try figuring somebody out? Somebody wants to be your friend? Maybe a co-worker, a new neighbor. Nowadays, you meet people on dating apps. And besides reading what they put on there, you do a Google search. What else is out there about that person before I, I commit to a date? Some people, it's easy to find out. Either one-on-one, -on -one, they're open books. They just You don't have any problems knowing what they're about, 
who they are. Other people, a little harder to get to know. But you know, one thing I found is true about human nature is that the, the closer that we want to get to someone or the, the more that we need to depend on them, the more we want to know about them. Can we trust them? Do they really care about me? We, we just want to know what we're dealing with. So did the people in Jesus' day. We know from the Gospels, as well as other historical writings, that Jesus walked this earth about almost 2,100 years ago now. We know he was a son. We know he was a brother. We know he was a teacher. And we know all that by the age that he's 12. Remember he taught in the temple and the elders were amazed? But from there until about age 30, we don't know anything about Jesus. Probably he was just a typical Jewish kid. By the time he was 15 or so, he would have expected to have memorized the Torah. You know what Torah is? Literally means law. It's the first five books of the Bible. Anybody get that done by the time they were 15? I won't ask any after that. Jewish kids do that today. They don't have to recite the whole thing, but... A part of what we would call confirmation is they're expected to know big parts of it. And they recite it. See, by the time Jesus begins his ministry, Jesus is an unknown to pretty much everybody. Except maybe those from that little town he grew up in. where there's bound to have been some controversy. You know, in a little town, and we're talking, archaeologists say not any more than 200 people lived in Nazareth at this time. So they all knew Joseph. They all knew Mary. And they also all knew that the timing didn't work out like it's supposed to between the birth of Jesus and when they got married. His parents got married. It's a little town. So little, so insignificant, that Nathaniel in John 1 says to Jesus, Can anything good come from Nazareth? This is really the backwoods. But there was a point when all that began to change. It wasn't necessarily that Jesus was seeking attention. In fact, he avoided it, but it came. Mostly because people talk. People began to take notice. Stories began to circulate about this Jesus of Nazareth. The lame walking, the, the deaf hearing, the blind seeing. Word on the street was this Jesus fella could still a storm and even raise the dead. These little towns we hear about are mostly on the eastern half of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus taught. He went other, way, other places too, but a lot of it was in that area. And at this point in time, they were mostly small towns, but they were on major trade routes going north and south. So a traveling merchant might walk in in a little town and wanted to discuss the price for his seeds, but what he left talking about was this Jesus guy. Word began to spread. And people began to ask, who is this man? Is he just a man? Or is he something more? Could he be? Could this be? The Messiah? 
Now let's remember where we are in the course of history and why Messiah is such a big deal. If you've been living in Jesus' day and someone began talking about the Messiah, you'd know exactly what they were talking about. Except for a brief 100-year period of independence, God's nation of Israel has been oppressed by different rulers and empires for, for over seven centuries now. The Syrians, the Babylonians, and Persians, then the Greeks, and now the Romans. Do you remember how they all memorized Torah? Well, they knew the promise to Abraham that his descendants would build a nation. They remembered the covenant made with David. They knew the prophecy. And they prayed for its fulfillment that one day a descendant of David would sit on the throne of Israel again. They were living under the rather oppressive thumb of Rome. And they long to see the freedom that the Messiah would bring them. Could it be Jesus? People wanted to know who it was that was talking to them. They're trying to figure it out. Maybe you are too. In any gathering even of believers, I... I would not assume that everyone here has, has completely decided who Jesus is, what to do with Jesus. Jesus didn't even assume this of his own closest followers. He poses to them the most important question that they would ever answer. This is how Mark records it. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. The way he asked them, who do you say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked them. Who do you say that I am? Pause here for a moment. Jesus has been with his disciples teaching all in the area of Galilee. But now, for an ungiven reason, they have headed north of that area, about 25 miles, not a quick walk, to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi might not have been on all the disciples' maps. It was a new city. Maybe been there 20 years by now. Named for one of the Caesar's sons, Philip. Another reason it might not have been on the disciples' map is because, well, it was a cultic high place in the worship of the Roman god Pan, P-A-N. Remember Pan? I picture him from the animated Hercules movie. And um, Danny DeVito voiced him. But he's half goat, half man. And I don't claim to know a lot about Roman gods, but Pan is kind of a troublemaker. It's where we get our English words pandemonium and panic from. Most Jews would not go near Caesarea Philippi because it was a place of false worship. But it was the perfect setting for Jesus to ask his disciples, who do you say that I am? They had all heard the rumors, the speculation, John the Baptist come back. That'd be pretty wild given that John had already been beheaded by this point. Is it Elijah? Well, 
He didn't die. He got taken up into heaven in the chariots of fire. Maybe he's back. Or some other prophet. But notice, Jesus is interested in what others think. He looks his disciples in the eye and says, I want to know what do you believe? Who do you say that I am? Wow. They've just been asked the most foundational, fundamental question for the entire story. Everything hinges on, on the response to this question. And finally, Peter answers, you are the Messiah. First John 4, we're told, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they are in God. Wow. Facing some trouble in life? You don't go alone. Son of God lives in you. Trying to mend a broken relationship. Don't mend it alone. The Son of God lives in you. Looking for something better in life, you're not looking alone. If you're grieving a loss, you're not grieving alone. If you're still, if you're, if you're searching to discover the true identity of Jesus, you aren't searching alone. The Son of the living God helped Peter. Jesus tells Peter, you didn't come up with this response all on your own. It's been shown to you by the Father in heaven. So just who is this Jesus? And what are we to, to get out of knowing? Well, first of all, we need to know that Jesus wants to show us his identity. He'll show you if you're willing to pay attention, to listen. Are you spending time reading your Bible? Do you take out time in your day to pray for insight? Do you spend time with the kind of people who can and want to help you? Jesus wants you to see that the Son of God lives in you. But he wants you to see more than that. After Peter confesses who Jesus is, Jesus responds in Matthew's account, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You see what Jesus is doing? Not only is Jesus telling them who he is, he's telling them who they are. Jesus isn't building his church on the back of Peter. He's building it on the truth that Peter revealed. We know Peter. He has his ups and downs. Not the most stable foundation to build anything on. He, he struggled with Jesus talking about his death. Even after proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God, it's Peter who denies knowing Jesus three times in fear of his own life. But Jesus could see what Peter couldn't see. He could see Peter's story. all the way to the end and how it fit into God's upper story. Jesus can see your story as well. Not sure or don't like the way your story is going? Well, Jesus can show you another side of your story. We need to let Jesus show that our identity is in him. So 
an important distinction. We have an identity, but we also have an identity in Christ. Years, years ago when I was an engineer, consulting engineer, we were trying to bid on a job or convince somebody to hire us. It wasn't just price. It was what we had to sell, the expertise of our people. And so we had to, everybody in the company had to have a little work biography, really. What's our education? Are we licensed and how? And what kind of projects have we worked on? Nobody, not even the president of the company, got to, to send his out the way he made it. It went through the marketing people. Now, I didn't see them ever create a lie on mine or anybody else's, but boy, they changed some wording once in a while. My last project is when I left to go into ministry. It was two years long, so I never got to put it on my biography. But I don't think it would have said what I often tell people. It was, I was overseeing the cleanup of a hazardous waste site. It was the project engineer. We had a contractor who was doing the work. They had a $35 million contract. They had two years to get the job done. At the end of two years, they had spent $47 million and only gotten 10% of the work done. So I figured after the marketing people had gotten through with it is Mr. Bart oversaw the $47 million cleanup of the Brio Superfund site, period. Not a lie, just not all the truth. That's the kind of story we create for ourselves or we help one another create. Everybody has in them something that wants to stand at the spotlight, in the center stage, to create an identity for themselves. Or they let someone else stand at the center of who they are and they tell them who they are. But you know, there's only one place available in the center of our lives. A table for one. And that place has a little reserved sign on it that we often ignore because that place is reserved for the Son of God. The reason we love being at the center of our own story is that we get to say, what goes? My body is my body. My time is my time. My resources, my money, my gifts, my talent, they're all mine. However, I will caution you. Standing in the center of your own story may sound tempting, but it comes at a high price. First of all, standing there is exhausting. And it will bring you nothing but anxiety. Where is my life headed? Am I, am I going in the right direction? What am I going to do? What does God want from me? Friends, if you want peace, step out of the center of your own story and invite Jesus into his rightful place. He's not going to push you out of the way but you'll never pass up an invitation. Life will never make sense at our level as long as we stand in the center of our own story, focused on our wants, our desires, and our needs. Jesus once was preaching to a crowd and he said, notice the birds. Notice the lilies of the field. Do they worry? No. Why not? Because the Father in heaven cares for them. How much more valuable are you than the birds of the air and the lilies of the field? Will your Father 
in heaven not care for you? Let Jesus show you his identity, his power, his authority over anything you are facing. And let him show you your identity in him as well. Step out of the center of your story. Let Jesus show you what he sees in you when you are a part of God's story. So be it. Our response to God's word begins this morning with our joys and concerns. Um, Pam McKee and her recovery from pneumonia had to go to the ER this week. And uh, instead of keeping her, they sent her home so she could go to church on Sunday. Well, good. Pain level down? To some. Well... Hopefully it'll keep going some more. Okay, good. Well, it's wonderful to see you. Um, Grace Whitaker was in uh, Parkview Wabash with several issues. She has been released and is now in rehab at Peabody. Not sure how long she'll be there. But keep you updated on that one. Uh, also got word this morning that uh, Tom Matheny, that's uh, the uh, Gothrop's son-in-law, um, his mom, Nancy Matheny, passed away uh, Friday or yesterday. I didn't write that down. But uh, So keep the Matheny family uh, in your prayers. Are there any other joys or requests? Anything from Facebook, Pam? Nope? Okay. Yeah. 45 minutes to an hour. Okay, so choir on Thursday will be right after the service is done. That's okay. two Thursdays. It's two weeks. In two Thursdays. For the 14th is... Yeah. Boy. I, <laughs> that's good. Uh, yeah, I missed that and I panicked. Sorry. Is there anyone that would like to have the microphone? So choir practice is Thursday, 7.30 here in the sanctuary this week. Yeah. Pat Meyer, I found out this week that one of the young men I had in Sunday school when we were in Edison got married. So Randy Young is now a married man. Any others? Seeing none, I remind you that we are praying. Went too far. Sorry, Pam. Uh, we're praying for Liberty Mills Church of the Brethren and Pastor Kelly Butler. Um, card is in the back. If you would like to sign it and haven't yet, you do that at the end of the service. Uh, and now uh, I invite you to join with me in our prayer of confession. The words will be on the screen. Let us pray. Lord, you call us to draw near, yet we fail to hear your voice. We sleepwalk through life, ignoring the needs of people all around us and worrying about our own desires. Forgive us when we shut out the call to climb into your presence, when we make excuses to put off that journey. Have mercy on us, O oh Lord, as we silently open our hearts and confess our sins. Let us continue our prayer. Hear our pleas, O oh God, and lift us to a newness of life. Amen. Listen to Jesus.
He will guide and care for you. Place your trust in him, for he is God's chosen, God's beloved. His ways are the ways of peace and hope. We continue our worship now with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Our offering sentence this morning comes from the third chapter of John. Whoever accepts his testimony confirms that God is true. The one whom God sends speaks God's words because God gives the Spirit generously. Let us consider these words as we give of our offering and listen to the offering. We give thanks for all that we have, for all that we have and are is a gift from you, that you give us the opportunity to give to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, amen. You may be seated. to come forward this morning we're giving an opportunity 
to kick ourselves out. Out of where we want to be, but where we shouldn't be. And make room for Christ our Lord to be a, an integral part of not just who we are, but of leading our life. Being at the center of who we are. And that night in which Jesus gave himself up, he had dinner with his disciples. He took bread, broke it, passed it around, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Given for you. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup. He passed it among them and said, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so here we are, a holy and living sacrifice, giving of ourselves, giving up ourselves, so that we might truly know who Jesus is. bread which we break is a sharing in the body. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Our ushers will serve you communion. Those of you at home, whatever you have for communion elements, works just fine. I'd love for you to have them. If you join us in a moment, we'll all partake at the same time. bread which we eat is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which
which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world by the strength of your Spirit, with Jesus at our very core, so that the world may know the Son of God. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. Ask ye what great things I know. The words will be on the screen and in your hymnal on page 163. Please join me in our blessing. Go now and make known the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bow at God's feet and serve the Lord with joy. And may God be your shelter. May Christ Jesus take away your fear. And may the Holy Spirit lead you in truth until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Go in peace to love and serve God. go, having been filled with Christ in our core, that all that we are, and all that we can be, is founded in Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Go in peace.